Ladies and gentlemen, dear guests and participants of the 14th Warsaw East European Conference in Warsaw. Uh, in uh, 2015, our institute, the Center for East European Studies, celebrated its 25th anniversary. On this occasion, we wished to present our history, activities, and most important events, publications, and projects of our center within the space of the last 25 years. And for the last 25 years, our center published numerous academic journals, books, and in ad addition, our, our center coordinates numerous scholarship programs, among others, uh, Konstanty Kalinowski scholarship program for candidates from Belarus, uh, Polish government scholarship program for young scholars, a uh, special program for Eastern studies, scholarships from East European uh, summer school, East European winter school, etc., etc. But a significant part of our center's activity is dedicated to academic conferences de dealing with the most important issues in the region. And the most important is, of course, Warsaw East European Conference, organized annually since 2004. During the last 13 sessions of Warsaw East European Conference, we had the honor of hosting many, many outstanding scientists, academicians, and politicians, such as, for, for example, former presidents, Valdas Adamkus, Lech Wałęsa, Viktor Juszczenko, Mi Michail Saakashvili, as well as Bronisław Garemek, Ellen Karel Damkos, Richard Pipes, Leszek Balcerowicz, Stanisław Szuszkiewicz, Leonid Krawczuk, Gennady Burbulis, and Gennady Burbulis, among them those who directly on, or indirectly contributed to collapse of communism. But this year, as you have probably noticed, for the first time since 2004, the conference director is not Jan Malicki. <laughs> by the way, but one information, by the way, uh, perhaps some of our foreign guests, guests don't know, but in present Poland, we are in a situation where after eight years of the rule of one political party, a different party uh, has won the, the elections. Since these elections in, in uh, 2015, we are witnessing a permanent and very strong political conflict between the ruling party and the opposition. The ruling party's slogan is that they bring a good change. Of course, of course, you know it very, very well, uh, like specialists in, in, in uh, politics, um, that, opposition, that the opposition is saying something totally opposite. These two words, good change, became two most popular words in Polish political debate now. And I do not, but I do not wish to discuss here with, with you about Polish internal politics. Nevertheless, as the Warsaw East European Conference Director for the last 13 years with full responsibility, I, I, Jan Malicki, I may say that changing Malicki for Mitzgel is a good change. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> 
To all the participants of this year's conference, I wish fruitful and inspiring presentations and debates. Thank you. John, the floor is yours. Dzień dobry Państwu, witam. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Warsaw University. Uh, you know who I am. Uh, I'm a longtime visiting professor here at the East Central European Studies Center, Studium Europe Wschodni, and unfortunately, this year's conference director. Uh, I'll take four minutes just to give you a very brief introduction so that we can move on with our program, which uh, I think is a very good one. Uh, the East European Studies Center hosts the East European uh, Conference, whose grandfather, God, sorry, godfather, uh, <laughs> is Jan Malitsky. Uh, and his aim and our aim is to bring together scholars uh, to present their research, to interact with colleagues from other parts of the region and beyond, and of course to network. Uh, this year's topic is East Central Europe vis-a-vis -vis global challenges. Uh, we're indeed lucky to have the cooperation of the George C. Marshall Center in Garmisch-Partenkirchen, uh, the University of Łódź, and the Israel Council on Foreign Relations in preparing this year's roundtables. We also appreciate the assistance of the Chancellery of the President of the Republic of Poland for helping us make this year's meeting the best ever. About 100 specialists will present and discuss over the next four days on a broad variety of topics, reflecting issues that are sometimes but not always at the forefront of domestic and uh, international importance. The best papers will be published in English in the Warsaw East European Review, and in fact, we just published uh, the best papers from last year, and they're available here uh, at this meeting. Uh, we had one reserved for an esteemed colleague and friend who passed away a few weeks ago, and I would like to ask you all to stand and observe a moment of silence for Professor Zbigniew Brzezinski. Thank you. I'm delighted to see uh, a lot of friendly faces in the crowd. Uh, from Warsaw, from Europe, uh, the Caucasus and Central Asia, from Israel, from the USA and Canada. I see our students from the Warsaw University Eastern S Studies Summer School. And of course, uh, I would like to acknowledge the diplomatic rep representatives, excuse me, of embassies in Warsaw who are and will be in attendance at the conference. And a partial list includes Ambassador Hani Leitinen of Finland, Professor Gabor Lagzi, the first secretary of the Hungarian embassy, and Otto Sipos, counselor at the Hungarian embassy. Jona Podkivanok, wherever you are. Uh, Mr. Uh, Ab Adel Abdel Ati and Avad Gabir of the Saudi Arabian embassy, representatives of the embassy of Tunisia. Uh, the Ukrainian embassy is represented by my old friend, Ambassador Andrei Deschitsia. Uh, Minister Councillor Volodymyr Baczynski and Secretary Olena Sibuch. Uh, I note with satisfaction the presence of many former and current representatives of the Polish government and particularly the foreign ministry. And I appreciate the interest of uh, members of the media who share the ideas presented by our colleagues here far and wide. No fake news here today. Uh, Jenki, I thank all of you for attending. Uh, and I'd also like to thank uh, and recognize the work of the team that put together the conference. These are all uh, the, uh, the team assembled by Jan Malitsky over years. They made all the arrangements for this meeting, and they include Piotr Evertowski, uh, Jerzy Malitsky, Karina Milnitska, Sasha Skidan, Yuri Tkachuk, and of course a team of volunteers uh, who have been with the center for quite a long time. Please give them all a round of applause. <laughs> One small but important change to our program. On day four Thursday, uh, Professor Miroslav Kroch was to have had a special session here at the conference. 
This morning, uh, we learned that Professor Kroch had a procedure on his heart and was unable uh, to meet with us on Thursday. Ah, we have also Ambassador Mohammed Al Madani of Saudi Arabia. We heard that you weren't coming, but I'm very happy to greet you. Thank you. Uh, and getting back to our uh, small change in our program, um, we're going to have uh, a substitution because we had such a lot of interest from our Be Belarusian uh, colleagues. My God, these diplomats are coming out of the walls here. Uh, Rafał Poberski, acting director of the Eastern Department of the Polish Foreign Ministry. Terrific. Uh, so anyhow, on Thursday, a small change to our program, but no change overall. We'll have plenty to talk about. And I wish you all uh, fruitful discussions and a pleasant stay in Poland's capital. For those of you who have been here before over the years, you've probably noticed that a few things have changed over time, which is good. Um, from our perspective, uh, I'd like to thank Vice Rector uh, Duszczyk and the University for its general financial support of these proceedings, uh, and the Polish Foreign Ministry, whose understanding of public diplomacy and the promotion of Poland uh, has, uh, over many years, exceeded the standards that apply in my own country. Uh, I invite Vice Rector Duszczyk to make his remarks, and I declare the 14th Warsaw East European Conference open. Thank you. Dear Eastern guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is my uh, great honor and privilege to welcome all of you uh, at the University of Warsaw on behalf of Professor Marcin Powis, who is the rector of our university. Uh, I would like to welcome especially very warmly Minister Krzysztof Szczerski, Professor Krzysztof Szczerski from the Jagiellonian University and the Secretary of State uh, in Chancellor of the uh, President of Poland, Andrzej Duda. And also, I would like to welcome uh, Mr. Matthew Briza, former, for former ambassador of Azerbaijan. Thank you very much for coming, and uh, we, are, uh, we are looking forward to your opening and keynotes, um, keynote speeches. Uh, this is the role of the rector, of course. I would like to also very, very warmly uh, thank uh, Director Malitsky for organizing this very important, this very important conference. I would like to, uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, whole team of the um, uh, of the um, of Eastern Eastern Studies, and uh, and I think that this conference it is the one of the one of the most important event uh, during the academic year, especially in 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 July. I think so. It uh, it uh, improve our knowledge about the problem of the regions in our regions, and also. Uh, it is absolutely fantastic opportunity to uh, to prepare recommendations how we can how we can uh, live in the much more safer place um, when never in the past. Uh, so I think so. This also unique place and unique uh, event um, uh, for exchanging different views, but also to listen to absolutely fantastic, um, fantastic lectures. As you probably know, the University of Warsaw is still the largest uh, university, uh, university in Poland. Um, in the present of Krzysztof Szczerski, Krzysztof Szczerski, I would like to, I, I don't want to say the University of Warsaw is the best in the Poland, <laughs> but uh, we are in the same place. In the, in the, the, if we take into account the last um, ranking of perspective, uh, newspaper and the University of Warsaw, University of Yale University are on the, on the top, the first place, together, first time in our history, and we cross the finger in the next year, we, we will also in the first place in, in Poland. Uh, so we have 21 different faculties and nine different uh, research centers. The, um, uh, we have uh, three and a half thousand of scholars, uh, over 45,000 of students, from 65 different different countries, we have also more than 800 different foreign foreign uh, collaborators uh, at the university, but also, of course, abroad abroad the Poland. So uh, I know that you are going to spend uh, next four days for discussion very very important very important issues, and I know that the I, I'm I'm quite sure that one of the very the very hot discussed uh, discuss issues will be the um, result uh, of the um, last visit of uh, President of the United States, uh, Donald Trump. We have, on the, we have in our room the father, I think, so this visit, Professor, Professor Krzysztof Szczerski. It is absolutely great opportunity to, to, to have you in, 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 
in, in, in our, at the, our university, especially after only a few days, after a few days, the visit of um, Mr. Trump, um, uh, President Trump in Poland. So um, I think that uh, I can stop now uh, because we, the director told me that I should speak um, uh, maybe whole hour, but I don't think so. It is a good idea. Uh, of course, I would like to, I would like to um, wish you absolute, absolutely fantastic, fruitful discussion. And we organized also the weather, which is that it is not very good for conferences, but still I think so you can have this absolute opportunity to, to enjoy our university, our absolutely fantastic historic campus, but also our, I would like to say, I was born here, our absolutely fantastic, beautiful capital city. Thank you very much. Vice Rector Dushik already did what I was supposed to do, which is basically to introduce uh, Minister Szczerski, who, as you heard, uh, comes from not really a rival institution, uh, but a great institution, and uh, uh, the oldest university in Poland and second oldest university in this part of Europe with a huge tradition, and occasionally, occasionally, they produce really good people. Uh, one of those people whom they produced about, uh, oh, I don't know, 15 years ago or so, uh, started his career at the university uh, teaching, became an associate professor, and then went into uh, a series of very important uh, positions in the state administration and uh, represented Poland uh, in a variety of institutions uh, in uh, the region and in Europe, and today he's the head of the presidential chancellery, which means that when things come out of uh, that big building on Krakowskie Przedmieście, it's been thought through by Minister Czerski, who dots the I's and crosses the T's. So uh, please come and make your remarks. Dzień dobry Państwu, dziękuję bardzo za tą miłe, miłą prezentację. Magnificencja, Panie Rektorze, Panowie Dyrektorzy, Ekscelencje, Państwo Ambasadorowie, wszyscy dostojni goście. That was the tribute to the uh, Polish law, accordingly to which I should suppose to speak Polish uh, in, uh, in official uh, statement. So uh, I will turn now to English, but uh, I have to make this tribute to the Polish language at the beginning of my speech which is actually significant, I would say, uh, from the very beginning that the lingua franca, the common language of the Central Eastern Europe, is English nowadays. And I'm very happy that we have uh, conducted this, that we're going to conduct this uh, conference in English, because uh, if you look at through the speech of uh, uh, President of US, uh, uh, Mr. Donald J. Trump, recently here, uh, speaking about the West, I think the uh, English would be the uh, lingua franca of the West, uh, as, as was defined by, uh, by President Trump. So it's good that we have a conference on the Central Eastern Europe uh, held in, in, that, uh, in that language. So it is my pl pleasure and honor, of course, to, uh, to be here at the uh, uh, fantastic University of Warsaw, and uh, especially at this, uh, at this very moment when you can open the, the debate of the Central Eastern Europe and the politics of Central Eastern Europe vis-a-vis uh, -vis global challenges uh, as uh, Dr. Malisky said, just a few days after the, uh, the visit of, uh, not only the visit of the President of the United States here in Warsaw, but also the few days uh, uh, after the uh, Three Seas meeting has happened here in Warsaw. That means the original meeting of the, of the 12 heads of, of state uh, from between the Adriatic, Baltic, and Black Sea, which was also a very significant uh, 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 event here in, in, uh, in our capital, and I will come back to it uh, later. So if I'm supposed to present uh, the way we think of, uh, of uh, uh, global challenges that comes to or that, uh, uh, that are present here in Central Eastern Europe, I would say uh, just a few, uh, a few, few remarks. First of all, uh, uh, from my perspective, as, 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 as I see it, the most important is uh, that the Central Eastern Europe is facing the geopolitical uh, challenge uh, uh, nowadays. That the geopolitics entered uh, the Central Eastern Europe quite uh, uh, significantly, and we know the date when the geopolitics finally, with the full-fledged, entered the, 
uh, Central and Eastern Europe. That was 2008, with the war in Georgia. With the war in Georgia, the, the, uh, the world has changed. It has changed for the first time in the first 21st century. Uh, uh, it has changed for the first time in 1991 when the Soviet Union collapsed finally. And we were all, all waiting and were hoping for having the, the world of uh, uh, globalization and peaceful cooperation. It changed again in 2001, 9-11, when we, when we realized that this uh, dream of the world without conflict and the dream of the world of, uh, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of um, globalization and common culture has ended because we entered the, the new period of the 21st century, which was the, uh, 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 the war on terror. And it, and it changed for the third time in 2008, uh, when, we start, when the first classical geopolitical war started in our region, uh, in Georgia. Uh, uh, because that was the, uh, uh, the classical uh, um, uh, proxy war of the geopolitics. So if we are supposed to talk about the challenges of the, uh, of the Central and Eastern Europe uh, in, a, in a global uh, scale, on a global, uh, global perspective, I would say that the presence of the geopolitics uh, in this region is, is, the, is the most significant uh, uh, global challenge uh, of the Central and Eastern Europe. Why? Because, as we all know, geopolitics is all about borders. Uh, it's, all, it's all about defining uh, uh, the, the unities, uh, uh, the political unities by borders. And the geopolitical borders defines the international relations in our region. And if you uh, follow the discussion of, uh, of the leaders of this region, uh, you can very uh, uh, frequently hear the word border. Where is the border? What are, where are the borders in, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, between the West and the rest, uh, between the Central Europe, Eastern Europe, the Western Europe, between the uh, safe zone and unsafe zone, between the pivot area and the, uh, and the peripheries. This is, this, the debates here in, in this part of, of the world is uh, uh, nowadays very much uh, over the, uh, the, the, uh, the question of, of, uh, of defining borders and, uh, and defining yourself vis-a-vis -vis borders. And, it's, uh, and of course also because uh, uh, in this region, this classical uh, uh, political border has also been challenged or, uh, or violated uh, uh, by the aggression. And this, is, this is the region when the borders uh, are, are constantly being, still even today, changed by aggression. The, we are moved, the, uh, the borders in this region are moved by aggression. Uh, it, uh, uh, the, the, the borders of, uh, in this region is defined by the frozen conflicts. If you, when you look, at, look around this region, you got the Transnistria, you got Abkhazia and Ossetia, you got the uh, now occupation of Crimea and, uh, and the war in the eastern Ukraine. It's uh, uh, the Polish-Ukrainian border is the last safe border towards east. Uh, uh, the next one is already uh, 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 the war border between Ukraine and Russia, between, between Russia and Georgia, uh, 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 in the frozen conflict of, of the Transnistria and, uh, and the others. So you see the, uh, uh, the geopolitics as I said, uh, 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 entered, re-entered this, uh, this region in 2008, and that's put all our attention to the question of borders. And in that context, uh, uh, the general goal of, uh, uh, of a politics in this, uh, in this part of the world, for, as, 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 as I say it, is to, is to secure the geopolitical orientation of the Central and Eastern Europe. This is the ultimate goal of, of our politics, is to secure the geopolitical orientation towards west of, of, this, uh, uh, of, of, the, of this region. Because when, it, when we talk about the borders, it's, uh, uh, we just want this region all together uh, uh, to be part of uh, uh, what, what we, uh, uh, what we uh, define as the, as the community of the, of the free nations, community of transatlantic community, uh, or, tr or as we say it in Poland, Euro-Atlantic community of, uh, of the free nations. So we want to secure the, uh, this uh, uh, geopolitical orientation of the Central and Eastern Europe towards the community of, of Euro-Atlantic uh, community of the free nations. Uh, but not only to secure it, but on also not to lose anybody on the way to secure this orientation. So Central Eastern Europe uh, 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 should and has to enter the, uh, uh, the community, Euro-Atlantic community, altogether as a united, as a one group of, uh, as a one community of, 
of the nations and states. Because if we lose someone on the, on the way, uh, that would be already the, uh, 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 the, uh, our mistake. So we have to not only secure the, uh, the orientation, but we also secure the community, the, the, the unity of the, uh, of the countries that, has, uh, that the society of, of which decided about the orientation of their own countries. Because we're not talking about the elites, we're talking about the society's choice. And you know that uh, uh, in some of the countries, like Georgia, like Ukraine, uh, people paid the, uh, the highest price for their choice. The highest price for the, ge for the, for, for, for the uh, choice of, uh, of the geopolitical orientation. They paid the, the price of their life. So, uh, so we have this moral obligation uh, also towards those, uh, uh, those societies of, uh, of the region to secure the orientation and secure them uh, all together as a unity. And we're not talking about the, uh, just the politics. Uh, uh, since these few days here in, in Warsaw, we're all debating of, about the world, the, the world uh, 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 that, as uh, I understand, was uh, somehow forgotten or even crossed out in the American debate for the last couple of years, which is the, the, the word civilization. Uh, uh, as I, when I talk to, uh, to, to the commenters, uh, uh, commentators from the, from the United States about the Trump speech in Warsaw, uh, uh, I, say what was the, the, I, I ask them what was the most shocking for them. Uh, they, uh, the, the, some of them at least said that the most shocking uh, was the fact that the President of the United States used the word civilization as, as the word defining the, uh, uh, the, Western, the Western community. Because uh, uh, civilization was, uh, uh, for many last years, was uh, uh, seen as, the, as a divisive word. Uh, uh, but, the, but the Trump used the word civilization to define this community of free nations and, and, uh, and states. And if that's the, uh, uh, the stake of the, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, geopolitics, if that is the stake of, of the global challenge, then we're talking about something more, much deeper than just the uh, um, that's just the question of the diplomacy. We're talking about the general uh, division uh, of, the, uh, of the cultural, civilizational uh, entities uh, uh, in the world. And if this is this on stake, that, at stake, that means uh, it's even more important to secure the geopolitical or civilizational orientation of the Central and Eastern Europe. So we are really talking about the, the moment in the, in, in the history and the moment of uh, of, uh, of the international politics here in Central and Eastern Europe that can have a, a, a really long-term uh, significance and long-term consequences of the, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the fate of the region. And from seeing that from that perspective, uh, uh, there's a, uh, one big question mark, of course. Do you really have any instruments to pursue these goals? Do you really uh, are uh, capable of securing the geopolitical orientation of the Central and Eastern Europe and to secure it as a, 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 a unity of, and a community of the free nations and free states. Uh, uh, do we, as the West, as it is now defined, uh, as the, the, the Euro-Atlantic community is, uh, as it is now, do we have the, the instruments to, to, to do so? And this is my question mark put also to you as the experts and specialists, because I doubt it. I think the instruments we are, uh, we are having now, like the very vague uh, Easter partnership of the European Union, uh, uh, quite protectionist uh, 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 views towards the opening the, uh, the markets towards the, uh, the, uh, the countries like Ukraine and uh, all those who have got free trade uh, agreements with the European Union. Very, uh, I would say, uh, 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 bluntly speaking, non enthusiastic uh, uh, debates over the enlargement of, uh, at, if the enlargement is any, uh, put on the, on the table at, at, at some occasions in the, in, the, in the European Union debates. Is that the, the instruments of, of the geopolitical pressure? Is it an instrument of geopolitical weight uh, uh, that we can exercise uh, uh, as a European Union towards the East? I really doubt this is the job, this is the uh, 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 the nature of the instruments uh, uh, in that context we have to, uh, we should uh, 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 use. And the same with the NATO. NATO is more uh, uh, real uh, and in the sense that you've got the 
real partnership, we got the real uh, exercise. We in, in Poland and Lithuania, we got the common brigade with, with Ukraine, the first of, the, of such, a, such a kind that we got the, uh, uh, so, we get, so, so our soldiers exercising together with Lithuanians and Ukrainians and at least we're breaking these, these borders. Uh, of, uh, of of NATO with this brigade, but still this is just uh, uh, just uh, 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 instruments of uh, 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 transitional instruments, so to say. These are not dis uh, uh, decisive instruments, and we all know that the NATO was all about to make the the, uh, uh, the serious pledge towards the Georgia and Ukraine in the very 2008 in the Bucharest uh, summit, and. Uh, and we stepped back that, uh, uh, they, they did step back that time. And the consequences we are following now. So, uh, so I don't believe, uh, uh, but this is, as I said, this is, I can open that for debate. Uh, I don't think we got the instruments uh, uh, that are uh, according uh, uh, to, the, to the situation we're witnessing. That this is the, the goals are, 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 are all the, you know, the, the visions, uh, our uh, dreams are, are high, but our instruments are very limited in, the, in, that, in that context. And uh, so what we can do uh, uh, to, uh, to change that situation? At least what, uh, what we believe and what is also the, um, the, the part of the international diplomatic uh, activities of my president, President of Poland, Andrzej Duda, uh, uh, is to uh, building up uh, the subjectivity of our region. It's to building up the, the political visibility and diplomatic capabilities of, of, the, of our region. Uh, uh, not as a confrontation, but as a, uh, as a capacity building effort. And this is the, uh, uh, why the Three Cs Summit uh, uh, we organized uh, passed so well, because uh, uh, we, we, we're talking about the, uh, the subjectivity, uh, uh, the visibility of the region through the practical instruments of economic cooperation just to make our region stronger, just to make our region more, region more cohesive, just to, uh, just to make our region, uh, 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 I would say, too big to fail. Uh, uh, and this is one of the ways uh, 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 we, may, we may enter uh, to this uh, global challenge through the back door, I would say, not to be confrontational in the geopolitical sense, but to enter uh, 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 by building up our own capacities. And in that context, I just uh, uh, recall the, uh, uh, what President Duda was uh, uh, saying, addressing the uh, diplomatic conference, or, or the ambassador's conference in Kiev. Uh, the President Duda was uh, 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 last year the, uh, the keynote speaker of the, of, the of the ambassador's conference in Kiev. And, uh, and what he said uh, was, we believe, very important but also Ukraine and the other countries of, of this part of, uh, of our common Central Eastern European uh, uh, region should invest more in a regional cooperation, should invest more in the links with the region of the Central Eastern Europe, because this is the only region for which the relations with Ukraine is not the function of relations to Russia. For everybody else, the relations with Ukraine, the relations with Georgia, the relations with uh, whatever country is always the function of their relations uh, with Russia. And when they get, uh, and, uh, and they will be all, always secondary. Only for this region, the relation with Georgia, Ukraine, uh, Moldova, and uh, Belarus, and uh, you can name all the countries, are the primary relations because this is the, our natural political environment. So, uh, and we believe this is not being yet exercised to the extent it should be exercised. Uh, uh, that the uh, enjoyment of the, of the interest of uh, uh, of the greater powers to, to, the, uh, to, to, to the region of Central Europe somehow uh, uh, limits their interest into uh, in building up uh, relations with, with, within the region. Uh, and this is uh, what we think wrong. Uh, uh, the Ukraine and the other countries should invest much more in building up the good relations with the, within the region for which, it, the, uh, 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 as I said, the relation to, towards East is the primary relations, not the secondary one. So uh, this was just a few, uh, uh, I would say, uh, I hope uh, provoking enough thoughts, uh, uh, food for thought, for, so, so you can uh, discuss and debate over that. I believe so. As I said, uh, this is uh, uh, the geopolitical game we are playing here in, in Central Eastern Europe. The geopolitics 
since today's we understand it also in this civilizational perspective. So this is the, uh, how, how important this region for the world politics is. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister Szerski. Uh, this morning, we're very fortunate to have uh, former Ambassador Matthew Brizza, uh, who did something that most uh, diplomats are probably afraid to do, to leave the Foreign Service and go out on their own and uh, to do something that is perhaps even of more interest than staying inside uh, Washington's foggy bottom. Um, Today, um, Ambassador Brizza will talk to us about NATO's East uh, and the United States from the perspective of somebody who lives in the region and looks at the world probably sideways, which is a very good thing. So please make your remarks. Uh, thank you, Professor Mischio, for those kind words, for getting me here. Uh, Dr. Malitsky, thank you for all your friendship throughout these years, including your lovely, wonderful daughter who uh, guided me through my family's ethnic homeland, Lviv, Lviv. Sorry if I just violated any Ukrainian sensibilities and hosted me for a wonderful uh, program about a year and a half ago. Uh, and Rector Dushchik, thank you for letting me be here as well. This is a very powerful place for me to be. I'm uh, totally Polish by background, 100%, and uh, my. Uh, I was looking out in front of my hotel today at the uh, monument to the victims of Soviet repression and the deportations, and uh, very powerful. I, I went and looked at all the towns on there that uh, you know, victims came from, and I saw my grandmother's region, Sambor, when she was only from a small village, but uh, you know, it made me think that uh, had she, like, like so many uh, other Poles, not taking a, a, a very difficult decision at that time. I, I probably wouldn't exist. It wouldn't be here speaking before you. Uh, and uh, the changes that this country has gone through would have never happened. There's, uh, fundamentally, my talk, I think, is going to end up being optimistic, but it's going to start pessimistic because the title is, uh, uh, yeah, U.S. relations with NATO's East under Trump shaking the foundation. But before that, I just want to build on, on some of the things that were said already and, and thank all the excellencies who are here, the ambassadors, the, the other members of the diplomatic community, the academic community, Ambassador Leitinen as well. I'm not sure where you are, but uh, uh, Professor was referring to my uh, new life outside of diplomacy. And I have a joint venture with a Finnish company, a great Finnish company, Lamor, based in Porvo. I'm on their board globally. Uh, fantastic environmental technologies company, uh, and it's really fun to be uh, involved in an uh, entrepreneurial endeavor, even if it's scary because, well, all my meager savings are on the line and I have to succeed. So it's very nice to be back then and have a chance to think uh, and stretch my mind, uh, be here with you in a place that my grandparents probably never would have been let in. They, there's no chance they could have passed through the front gate. So it's a very powerful moment for me. Thank you. And also to be an opening speaker together with uh, Secretary of State Szczerski and with my favorite boss of all time, Ambassador Daniel Fried, uh, closing the conference. Um, Dan taught me so much about this part of the world, which I'll, I'll get to in a moment. Uh, enabled me and enabled my, my dear friend Kurt Volker, who is now the new special representative for Ukraine, uh, to make it, to move through the State Department system when there were all sorts of bureaucratic obstacles. And we were, if you go back and Google us, you'll see we were attacked by the Washington Post uh, when we were brought to the State Department from the White House in 2005. We were, there, there, there's a position in the State Department called DAS, D-A-S, Deputy Assistant Secretary. That's kind of the first level where things get serious and you know where you actually can have an impact on policy so we were called the baby dasses because we were brought over at a, a kind of a younger age than normal uh thanks to secretary rice and ambassador freed and uh, dan suffered because of that in, inside the bureaucracy a lot of people disliked him because he enabled ambassador volker and me and then another uh uh, ambassador Mark Pekula, Pankawa, Polish guy as well, who became ambassador to Latvia. Anders is out here somewhere. Spruits. Uh, and I remember uh, Mark at the time was 50, and he said, boy, only in the State Department and in Washington could a 50-year-old guy be criticized for being a baby. So it's great to be outside of Washington. It really is. I live in Istanbul now, by the way. Um, so my, my speech, it will build on much of the powerful insights of, of Professor and Secretary of State Szczerski 
And I'm, I'm so um, tempted just to react and, and embrace what you said. I mean, you really reminded me of uh, sort of the context for many of the things I want to say. Uh, so what I'm, what I'm going to talk about, I guess, well, you should know a little bit more about my background. I, I, I am much closer to the Republican side of Washington than the Democratic side. I, I'm not a member of any party. I was, yes, nominated by President Obama to go to uh, Azerbaijan, but I was always closer uh, to the Republicans and to President Bush and Secretary Rice. So I'm gonna, when I'm tough on President Trump in a moment, uh, you, you'll know it's not that it's some sort of a knee-jerk ideological response. Um, but it comes from um, uh, discomfort with what I fear on the President's part is a lack of what Professor Szczerski was just talking about, that geopolitics have returned to this region. And, and really, they should never have left. Um, but and the president's chief advisors, whether it's Secretary Tillerson or National Security Advisor McMasters, or best of all, a Secretary of Defense Mattis, I think they understand this. Uh, but I think the president doesn't. I don't think he has a geopolitical vision. His speech here, I'll get into it in a little more detail, said the right things, but in a strange way in some cases. Uh, not as clearly, I, I would argue, as, as he should have said. And I think that's because he doesn't feel it. I feel, we all in this room feel it. We feel what Professor Szczerski was saying. We feel that geopolitics was here, that the world changed in 2008 when Russia invaded and occupied Georgia. We know it. I, I by the way, was in the middle of that and in the question and answer session. I'm happy to talk a lot about that. But I don't think President Trump feels it. Um, so that's starting to get pessimistic, but let's, let's think about the positive just a little bit longer. Uh, if you look at where Poland was, obviously, in 1989, uh, it's in a miraculous place now. It's, it's, yes, you walk around the city, and it's got so many gleaming skyscrapers now, restaurants from all over the world. For goodness sakes, it's poles walking down the street are indistinguishable in appearance from, from any other European nation. Poland has really returned to Europe. Thank God. And geopolitically, economically, culturally, socially, of course Poland is the heart of Europe, but people forgot about that for a while. Um, we've had some crises recently that maybe worry us. Of course, obviously, Russia's invasion and occupation of Ukraine. But that also woke us up. Um, I was running a think tank in Tallinn for a couple of years, for three years. And when I arrived there in 2012, um, President at the time, Ilves, said, please make your primary mission. At the, it's a Ministry of Defense think tank, uh, International Center for Defense and Security in Tallinn. So the president said, please make your primary mission to reawaken Washington to the reality that the geopolitical work in the Baltic region, extended, including Poland, of course, isn't over. In Washington, it feels too much like people think once the Baltic states and Poland entered NATO, entered the European Union, the hard work was over. And these countries became you know, successful, quaint, beautiful places where there weren't any big geopolitical problems to be concerned with anymore. So in my, uh, my, my, my first day, the first paper that I reviewed that our, our center wrote was how do we get NATO's attention? And the proposal, I'm ashamed of what I'm about to say about myself, the proposal uh, the core of it was, well, we ought to, pr we ought to uh, ask NATO to pre-station equipment, not so much people, but equipment, on the territory of NATO's east. And I vetoed it, because I said, if we say that, people in Washington and Brussels and other European capitals are going to think we and you Estonians are hysterically anti-Russian. Uh, that, was, that was a strange mood in 2012, even for me, somebody who totally believes in the never-ending significance of geopolitics. Um, but I was reacting to what I would hear all the time in Washington, reacting to my experience in 2008 and in the lead-up to 2008 as President Putin was preparing to invade Georgia. Those preparations went on for years. And when I would ring the alarm bell, I would often be told that I should focus more on managing President Saakashvili, um, having him quiet down, uh, not encourage him to be uh, more aggressive. Uh, and it, it actually drove me crazy. I got that from my bosses, uh, from my fellow mediators, German, French, and British. At one point, my British counterparts looked at me when I was making the point that the EU and US need to do more to deter 
uh, Russian creeping uh, uh, aggression in Abkhazia and South Ossetia. British counterpart pulled me aside at a dinner. He said, Matt, have you lost your mind? Have you lost your mind? You're just going to embolden President Saakashvili if the Europeans are pushing back in the same direction Saakashvili is asking. And I, I said, no, Sir Brian, uh, I, I'm not. I haven't lost my mind. There will come a time where we will lose our ability to shape the events on the ground in Georgia. It's coming. And President Putin is provoking it, whether it be through intelligence operations that resulted in assassinations or giving passports to Abkhaz and South Ossetians, Russian passports, I mean, or enabling smuggling through the Roki Tunnel joining Russia and Georgia that then undermined Georgia's uh, reforms, or launching a, a missile attack on the day Secretary Rice and Ambassador Freed were in Georgia, a missile attack in South Ossetia that blew up uh, a Russian air uh, Georgian air defense radar. These provocations were coming, but it was an inconvenient truth for many in Washington, and in Europe that Russia could possibly really be moving in this direction of aggression towards Georgia. So my assignment was constantly to get Saakashvili to calm down and, uh, and let us move on with our other business at that time, which was uh, recognizing Kosovo as an independent state. Uh, well, at one point, it was no longer possible to calm down Saakashvili. Russian troops poured into Georgia. Saakashvili ended up getting blamed by the international narrative for having launched the war. I'll go to my grave thinking that's absolutely wrong based on the intelligence I was reading live. It was a provocation. Had he been wiser, perhaps he would not have intervened or he would not have uh, counterattacked on Skin Valley. That would have been a wiser approach. But he reacted. And now he goes down in history as being uh, imperious and uh, uh, uncontrollable. And, uh, well, the narrative was that somehow uh, Russia had been provoked into attacking. Well, now, as Professor Szczerski said, maybe we see things in a different light. Maybe we realize that was the first moment, as you said, of the world changing and the return of classical geopolitics to our extended region. The funny thing is, at the time, uh, none other than then President of France, Nicolas Sarkozy, made the same point, but he didn't really understand, I think, what he was saying. If you go back and read the Washington Post on, I, I think it was August 18th of 2008, you can Google it, um, he had an op-ed in which he said, essentially, to paraphrase, um, okay, this is terrible what happened, uh, but really, Russia's not going to leave Georgia, so let's move on, which I'll get to that phrase, move on, in a second, in the context of Secretary Tillerson. We have to move on. And, uh, but if Russia moves against Ukraine, this was in 2008, if Russia moves against Ukraine, then there must be serious consequences. And okay, so Russia did move against Ukraine, but everyone remembers the initial responses on our part were very soft and slow. Secretary of State Kerry, I remember, in the beginning uh, was saying, remember the quote, he said, yes, this is a problematic situation, but um, Ukraine has not become, how did you put it, uh, an object of east-west competition between, between the U.S. and its NATO allies in Russia. Of course it had. It was obvious to everyone, right? The whole, we know what the Russian move was about. It was about freezing Ukraine in place and not letting Ukraine fall off the train, as you were talking about, Professor Shtersky, as the rest of the region moves toward the west. Um, I, was, I even talked to Nick Gowing. If many people know who he is. He's an anchor on BBC. I was at the Brussels Forum, and I, I called him on this. At the time, he said, um, he said, this was in February of 2014, Russian troops appear to have crossed the border into uh, eastern Ukraine. They were having a military exercise there. Um, that must all be some sort of a misunderstanding. It couldn't be that Russian troops moved into Ukraine by design. He said that live on TV. And uh, so two months later, or a month later, I saw him in Brussels and asked him, do you realize you said that, Nick? He said, did I, did I actually say that? He said, yeah, yes, you did. And he said, oh, well, you know, just like you, I was reacting to events just as they were happening. But that was his instinct, right? And that was the West's instinct even until February 2014, when the little green men are invading Ukraine, still our, some of our opinion makers simply couldn't believe that Russia would do this. So that kind of gets us uh, to today. Oh, and, and, and the good side. So we finally woke up after uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine and occupation. Warsaw summit, 
of NATO. It was a great moment. We finally have overcome our self-imposed limitation on not deploying NATO troops and U.S. troops to this part of the world. That is a huge strategic development. Um, we have now a consensus, it seems like, on sanctions, not as tough as they should be, both U.S. And, and EU sanctions. They could be much tougher. Still, the conventional wisdom is Russia and Putin's Russia have stepped beyond the, the construct of civilized behavior of uh, uh, the international legal system that we all came to, well, commit ourselves to after World War II. That part's good. Um, but the foundation of East-West relations, or the foundation of our post-war environment, I think is under threat now across Europe and also in President Trump's, Trump's uh, vision. So what, what is that foundation? Foundation, of course, is Article 5, right, of the North Atlantic Treaty, collective defense. Another foundation is the Bretton Woods institutions, the World Bank, the IMF, to promote economic reform, modernization, uh, economic growth. Um, I would argue NATO enlargement has also been one of the geopolitical tools, clearly, that helped to cement the borders uh, of the post-World War II era in a way that protects the freedom of the people of this region, uh, but also protects their right to decide their own historical destiny. Fundamentally, to me, that's what it's, this is all about. You all, from whatever country you hail, should have the right to determine the geopolitical orientation and the civilizational location of your country, of your society. No one should dicta dictate that to you. In the uh, late 1980s and early 1990s, these institutions and these ideas really drove U.S. policy. And, uh, Ambassador Freed, I hope he'll talk about it uh, when he's here, but he was one of the innovators. He was one of the first people, with also Chris Hill at the time, who was a staffer uh, in Congress, who said, we need to use the World Bank, the IMF, uh, not yet NATO, uh, to provide support for the new Polish government uh, after 89 to make clear that if Poland undertakes the thoroughgoing revolutionary reforms of Leszek Balcerowicz at the time um, and, and then President Wałęsa, then the West will be there. We will be there with our financial support, our security support, our political support, because it is, it is in our own fundamental national security interests that these countries, former captive nations, are independent, are free, choose their own destiny, and thank goodness they choose to be with, together with us because that's their fundamental identity in the first place, and we are stronger with them together with us. We're not weaker, we're stronger. Um, so now, finally, to President Trump's speech and, and the Trump administration. So the Three Cs Conference was a great event. I spent. 14 of my 23 years in the U.S. Foreign Service promoting these very ideas, uh, promoting diversification of energy supplies for our European allies, especially natural gas, away from an overdependence on Russia. That's exactly what the Three Seas Conference is about. We face, or we, we have, a, a historic opportunity to rewrite the geoeconomic map today. Thanks largely to technology, a lot of it developed in the United States, uh, but not only. Technology that allows natural gas to be turned into liquid form and sent anywhere in the world on ships. Thanks to revolutionary technology uh, in the United States that allows the extraction of massive amounts of natural gas in new and unconventional ways through horizontal drilling and fracturing of, of the rock uh, underneath the surface. And thanks to the geopolitical vision of Poland and of Lithuania in um, contracting for their own liquid natural gas import terminals. We know that also in Croatia, in Kirk, there's a long-standing proposal also to have a liquid natural gas import terminal there. And then now with the Three Seas Initiative, there's a vision that we've worked on a lot at the Atlantic Council as well, where I'm also a senior fellow, to link up all these markets between the liquid natural gas terminals and make sure no single monopolist, Gazprom, but no, no other aspiring monopolist has the ability to manipulate the price of natural gas to keep the price high or to apply political pressure on the countries of the region. And we all know, no need to go into it now, but Gazprom has a long history of using natural gas pricing and cutoffs for geopolitical, uh, as geopolitical pressure. So it's great 
It's great that this Three C's conference happened. Uh, it's amazing that President Trump spoke at it. I mean, in my 14 years working on these issues, it was impossible that the U.S. president would show up at an event on this topic. It was, the issue of pipeline interconnections, liquid natural gas, pricing, monopolistic pricing, that is so down in the weeds, uh, the U.S. president would really probably never take the time to do it. I had one exchange with President Bush on it, and he's, this was back in like 2006, after the Russians cut off the gas the first time to Ukraine and the EU. And he said, okay, now, let me get this straight. Um, you're saying we need to work on all these diversified pipelines to Europe. Mm -hmm, that's right, Mr. President. Um, but none of my EU colleagues talk to me about this. I said, yes, that's right, Mr. President. They don't quite yet see the geopolitical significance of allowing themselves to be so dependent uh, on Russia. Well, tell me one thing. Why, why in the world should I care, should we care more than they care? Hmm, that's a good question. And the answer was be because they're coming around. And Russia will be Russia. And there's one cutoff today, and there'll be more. Uh, and they're going to wake up, and they're, you know, they're starting to understand. So OK, but still, these issues are too down in the weeds, too technical for a president. But President Trump came. He gave a speech. He highlighted the geopolitical significance of US natural gas now being able to come to Poland, and hopefully onward to Ukraine, and into Lithuania, and hopefully throughout the whole region. Great. But the way he did it, the way he did it, it sort of grated on me. It, um, it suggested he, didn't, he doesn't feel it, going back to my earlier remarks. He, he made a joke out of it. You know, he said, and uh, we're going we're gonna to talk about, we talked about the liquid natural gas terminal at Kirk Island, Croatia. He turned to somebody and said, you ever hear of that one? You ever hear, yeah, it's a great project. Uh, kind of dismissively. That, that, that was painful to me, to be honest. And he said, oh, and there's also the Greek-Bulgaria interconnector, uh, great project. But clearly, he, he really doesn't know what these things are. He's heard about it. His brilliant uh, staff have written this into his speech. It would have, again, a dream for me to hear such words by the previous US presidents. But I fear he doesn't yet feel it. I hope he'll get there. But I don't feel he yet feels it. His main speech. I loved what I heard uh, when I first heard it. And clearly, he was scripted. He stayed to the script, right? He, had a, a, he, he read a speech with geopolitical vision, said some great things, talked about Article 5, right? He, he said, what did he say? He said, uh, uh, the United States uh, shows its commitment to Article 5 not only through words, but through actions. I think he means the deployment of US troops to Poland. Fantastic. But he's, he didn't say, I unequivocally stand by Article 5. I reiterate that the United States will never, never swerve from its commitment to the collective security of all of our NATO allies, right? I mean, after the debacle at NATO headquarters, you recall, in May when he visited, in front of the, in front of the monument to Article 5, which consists of the twisted steel from the Twin Towers, the World Trade Center in New York, which is the first and only time Article 5 has ever been invoked, right, to defend the United States. He didn't mention Article 5. In, instead, he, he, he criticized our European allies, unlike Poland, for not spending 2% of their uh, GDP on, on defense. Or not GDP, but of their budget on defense. So it, this would have been a great opportunity to make clear, once and for all, we totally stand behind Article 5, and we're never not going to. But, but he. He waffled a little bit, or he hedged, at least it seemed to me. Maybe I'm too sensitive, I don't know. But I, I, think, I think he hedged a little bit on that. It was fantastic that he mentioned Poland's enduring fight for freedom. We even went wiped from the face of, of, of the map. And that he talked about the civilization of the West. Great. But then he sowed a little bit of doubt, again, into the, the whole concept. He said, but it's not clear the West has the internal strength uh, to protect itself, to fight, to, to be free. Um, and then he sort of took a swipe at the European Union and, and at European unity with that strange final passage, probably written by Steve Bannon, I guess, his ultra-right advisor, that said, and one of our great enemies is bureaucracy and centralization of authority. And it, it, was, it was, yes, I know it was taking a swipe at the size of the US government, but it also struck me as also criticizing the European Union's unity. And if there's one thing that is the foundation of the geopolitical realities that we hope to create forever in this part of the world, it's that Europe has to stand together, just as you were saying, Mr. Secretary of State, and not let anyone fall off the train. 
but he seemed to be sort of also calling into question whether or not that value of European unity uh, is worth pursuing, even while he's saying we need to be strong and we need to fight uh, for our freedom. He, um, he criticized, thank goodness, he criticized Russia for its occupation of Ukraine, thank goodness, and for Russia's relations with hostile states, governments of Syria and Iran. But then at the press conference, when he was not scripted, <laughs> when he was asked about the Russian meddling in U.S. elections, right, the, the hacking and the hacking of the Democratic National Committee, emails and other things, uh, which all or 17 U.S. intelligence agencies say happened, and they say they agree that it was Vladimir Putin himself, himself, who ordered this and directed it. President Trump said, yes, the Russians were involved, but maybe some others were as well. Where does he get that? I mean, the, his own intelligence agencies say it was Vladimir Putin himself who directed this. Nothing about any other, in, uh, any other country. And if you go back and read, there was an amazing story in a, was at the Washington Post a couple of weeks ago about the, the Obama administration's failure to do anything before the election when it was found out by the administra then administration that this hacking was happening and that President Putin was directing it. Um, one, one former senior Obama administration official is quoted as saying, this is maybe our biggest failure, that we failed to bring out this information to the world before the election happened. President Trump is saying, well, okay, the Russians were involved, but maybe others were, so maybe this thing that the Obama administration says is our biggest failure, eh, maybe it's not that big of a problem, and maybe we should, we should move on. Um, so what's he doing? Uh, well, why are there these contradictions in what his staff says and what he says? I, I think what he was doing was trying to protect his flank against criticism in Washington about the ties of his team and his family to Russian security services on the one hand, because that is a huge, as we know, scandal in Washington. So he wanted to look tough, but he also wanted not to go too far and make upset the man he's about to meet for the first time, President Putin. Um, by the way, there was an extraordinary uh, uh, story in the New York Times yesterday. Uh, I'm sure everybody has seen this, saying that Donald Trump Jr., Donald Trump Jr. met after Donald Trump Sr. became the Republican nominee, met with someone, a representative of uh, a lawyer of some Russian uh, state-owned company interests, trying to get derogatory information about Hillary Clinton to use against her in the election campaign, which echoes what then-candidate Trump said when he encouraged, he encouraged the Russian security services right, to steal information about the Clinton campaign and publish it on WikiLeaks. It's mind-boggling, uh, it, absolutely mind-boggling that the U.S. presidential candidate is advocating espionage uh, against a former Secretary of State, former Senator who's running against him for president. So for these reasons, I, I, I feel that this, all the foundation I've been describing of our geopolitical vision is, is truly shaken at this point. And we constantly see um, President Trump making a statement and then his senior staff walking it back, saying, well, that, that's not what he really meant. Um, I think President Trump, like President Obama, distrusts foreign policy elites. Uh, to, to be fair, um, after uh, President Obama violated his own red line in Syria on the use of chemical weapons, you all know what I'm talking about, he said, until till this, till this day, I'm proud I did that, I'm proud I violated my own threats, because had I acted upon it, I would have simply been uh, kowtowing to the foreign policy elites in Washington rather than using my own instincts. So obviously President Obama uh, pulled us back in the world and uh, pulled us away from a geopolitical vision, basically vacated Europe in many ways and then had to come, basically come running back after uh, Russia invaded Ukraine. Again, happy to talk all about the Obama administration as well, just that all the Trump stuff is so fresh. So I'm going to focus on that now. Um, so then, I'm just about done. President Trump gets to the G20, and uh, it's absolutely remarkable. Not even what was said, I'll we'll come to that in a minute, but what was done and shown. The handshake, the handshake with President Putin. Everybody, you must recall the, all the crazy handshakes that President Trump has given to Shinzo Abe, the, the Japanese prime minister, where he's pulling his arm, and Abe, is, afterward, he looks like this, like his, his hand is in pain. 
And then there was the, 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 the Titanic standoff between Emmanuel Macron and, and, and President Trump, where Macron kind of got the best of him, really squeezed Trump's hand. You, if you watch, watch some of the video footage, President Trump, even with Vice President Pence, pulls him on stage. It's all to show who's boss, right? Um, and you met uh, 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 Prime Minister Trudeau of Canada when he was at the White House. He came up to President Trump, put his arm around President Trump, so President Trump had no leverage. And Trudeau, Justin Trudeau, he's a boxer. He's really in great shape, so he was pulling President Trump. So the handshake means something. It means something to President Trump. Go back, and you can watch it on the Financial Times website. They've got it all the time on the Putin handshake. What did President Trump do? Well, first, nothing. President Putin did nothing. He waited. Putin waited. What was he waiting for? What was he waiting for? Waiting for Trump to go first. Because the symbol of President Trump reaching out his hand was the moment Russia got out of the penalty box, right? Russia's got all these sanctions on it. It wants them to be lifted. It's seen as a pariah by all the rest of us, especially by the United States under Obama. I mean, Obama and Putin hated each other. So Putin is waiting for, for, for Trump to reach out. Trump did it. Not only that, he only clasped his hand for a moment, and he even put his left hand on Putin's hand, trying to ingratiate himself, show extra respect, Nothing I've ever seen him do to anyone, not even his own vice president, whose arm he's pulling and trying to show his boss. I think that says a lot about his psychology. He has come to office, President Trump, absolutely convinced that he's the only one, he's the only person who can create a breakthrough in U.S.-Russian relations. He's not the first U.S. president to do that. George W. Bush, my beloved boss, we all know, looked into President Putin and got a sense of his soul, right? We all know that story. And, Obama had his Russia reset policy, and Bill Clinton had the spirit of Bill and Boris, if you may remember that, from Vancouver to Vladivostok. We were going to reshape the world and have strategic partnership. Every new American president romanticizes Russia, thinks he, eventually she, is going to be the one that creates the breakthrough. And everyone is disappointed in the end because Russia remains Russia. Russia will pursue its national interests. Its national interests do not overlap with, with ours largely, except in wanting prosperity and not wanting to eliminate each other with nuclear weapons. Otherwise, our worldviews are pretty diametrically opposed, uh, and President Trump will learn this eventually too, but it hasn't happened yet. So, President, or, uh, Secretary Tillerson, how did he describe the meeting between Trump and Putin? He said, well, uh, several times President Trump raised the issue of the election interference by Russia. He didn't say President Trump confronted, didn't say criticized, he said raised. Foreign Minister Lavrov came out and said, President Trump accepted President Putin's explanation, which is that Russia didn't do it. Hmm, that's suspicious. So you could say, okay, maybe Secretary Tillerson just, you know, he's not a diplomat, he just headed the world's biggest oil company. Um, maybe he just was not careful. But then he chose to say what? He chose to say, the good news is, the two presidents did not agree to relitigate the past. Relitigate the past. They agreed to disagree, in other words. <laughs> so if, if Rex Tillerson was still the CEO of Exxon, and let's say Shell owed Exxon a billion dollars, would he have a meeting with the CEO of Shell and say, okay, we can forget about the billion dollars you owe us, right? Don't worry about it. We're not gonna relitigate the past. You cheated us, but let's move on. Of course not. Why is it not okay for a huge company, but it's okay for the United States? to let Russia out of this penalty zone, for what? Simply for the purpose of building a, whatever it means, a more constructive US-Russian relationship. First of all, that relationship is not an end in itself. It's a tool to do other things, the US-Russian relationship. And secondly, it's never gonna be a constructive relationship if it appears that the US leader can be so manipulated by his Russian counterpart. Uh, so for all those reasons, uh, I'm pessimistic about this current moment. Yes, geopolitics are now the defining factor in this part of the world and always should have been. Yes, there have been some great developments. Uh, people like me will no longer say, well, we can't write a report that says NATO ought to preposition material in the Baltic region in Poland. We, we actually have troops on the ground now. Fantastic, we've woken up. Got to make sure, of course, that those Warsaw summit commitments uh, are maintained. And we know with your boss, 
<laughs> Professor Sterski, he wasn't clear, President Trump, on how committed the U.S. is to keeping our troops here on the ground. I won't even look at you, so don't put pressure on you to respond, but um, that's a very worrisome development. Ultimately, though, my very last remarks, ultimately, I am optimistic. Ultimately, because President Trump lacks geopolitical vision, lacks historical insight, or really even, frankly, I don't mean to be uh, disrespectful, but curiosity about history. Uh, everything is about the deal, one-on-one, -on -one, right? The individuals, the people. That's why he had nobody in the room, which is what Putin wanted, besides Rex Tillerson and the interpreter when they met. And so what's inevitably, inevitably going to happen is we'll start out with a grand bargain, right, where something happens on Ukraine, mostly cut over the heads of the Ukrainians, but thank goodness with Ambassador Volker there, I think, you know, I know he's no fool and he'll fight against that. But probably there'll be an agreement, which I know that the Trump administration, from my own context within, has been cooking up, hoping for, for a long time, whereby President Putin gets what, gets what he needs. He gets an excuse to exit Donbas, because that's a failed operation. The uprising never happened that he expected. The Russian troops are dying. It's an albatross economically around the neck of Russia. But he can't just leave, right? He can't just pull out Russian troops, because that'll really hurt him domestically, politically. So OK, he says we, we've re-entered the geopolitical stage. We're at the center of it with President Trump. This is what Putin will say. We'll pull out of Donbass. We're never leaving Crimea. So that'll be the deal, I think. Donbass, if the Ukrainian government offers autonomy, you'll have a, a, a sort of frozen political conflict in Donbass. Troops gone, heavy weapons pulled back on the Russian side. Crimea is still what it is, uh, unschlussed by Russia. And then the other area where there'll be cooperation is Syria. And we've already seen in southeastern Syria, there's a the cease, modest ceasefire that seems to be holding. That's great. May it work. However, it also uh, uh, provides U.S. blessing for Russian troops deeper into the Middle East, base, uh, basing thereof that has never happened before. But, okay, leave that aside. Maybe, maybe it'll bring peace. But eventually, that cooperation in Syria will collapse. Russia has no history, no history of successfully establishing peace and rebuilding economies and complex cultures. It has no history, right? It, it, uses, it used brutality. Uh, in the 1940s and 50s and 30s uh, to, to, to build the Soviet Union, but it doesn't have the finesse to rebuild something on the scale of Syria. And so Trump is going to be disappointed. President Trump will be disappointed with President Putin. President Putin will inevitably overplay Russia's hand. And finally, at that point, my last remark, if the EU and NATO have maintained their cohesion, remain strong, maintain this geopolitical vision of President Duda and, and uh, Secretary of State Shtersky, then we have a chance to take these positive developments and push away the lack of clarity, the, 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 the dalliance with Putin and the security services on the part of Team Trump, and finally wake up, just as Obama wake, woke up, just as President Bush woke up and realized he didn't see Putin's soul, and then maybe rebuild. So the key to all this is, while we're in this holding pattern, that you all are doing exactly what you said, Mr. Secretary of State, taking the strategic reins in your own hands, pursuing initiatives like the three C's, changing the geopolitical facts on the ground so that when the U.S. does finally wake up, we know which way to move. Thank you very much. Although we didn't really speak about questions uh, after these excellent presentations, you gentlemen didn't really think that we were going to let you leave here without taking a few. And in fact, the doors have been already bolted by Yuri Tkachuk and Dierze Malitsky, so you can't escape. What I would like to propose, since we have a few minutes, if you would be so kind, come to the front, uh, have a seat, and take a few questions from uh, the audience, and especially from students, both of you, please. Uh, Professor Szczerski in particular became an academic because he likes contact with students and he, he likes tough questions, so I invite those of you who have questions to please use the mics and identify yourselves.
It's like Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we know that the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, as a word, the occupation of Azerbaijan territories by the Armenia, the main part of the geopolitical confrontation in the post-Soviet region. And uh, Mr. Mitchell Braza, he used to be uh, ambassador of Azerbaijan, and before he is a representative of United States of America in Minsk Group. Minsk Group is dealing with Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, occupation of Azerbaijan territories, try to do something objectively, but we don't believe that it's objectively because few days before. Armenian armed forces killed two years girl in Nagorno-Karabakh but Minsk group made objective uh, uh, speech or objective declaration regarding this. And nobody of you mentioned about the Nagorno-Karabakh or occupation of Azerbaijan territories by the Armenian Republic of Armenia when you talked about the uh, geopolitical confrontation in this region. We know that as you mentioned, the uh, Nagorno-Karabakh is a problem of the political rivalry in the region. And Azerbaijan also ha paid high prices for this. Why is uh, Mr. Mitubraza know knows this uh, process very well? Azerbaijan, as Azerbaijan realized regional energy project, transportation project, which is very important also for the Eastern Europe, also security also, so it's a high price for Azerbaijan. Why you didn't mention about the Nagorno-Karabakh as a geopolitical rivalry in this region? Thank you very much. Uh, if, if I may just say, uh, with the full respect to uh, Professor Mitzgal, I'm afraid I, I, I have to leave in a couple of minutes uh, from here because I see on my, on my phone that uh, people are getting crazy. <laughs> Not to answer questions, uh, not to answer the phones for an hour or something already. So, uh, uh, with the, uh, uh, I would say, uh, from our perspective, you should uh, uh, all know, we all know that uh, Poland will soon enter the Security Council of the, European, uh, of the United Nations, uh, uh, which means that uh, starting 2018, with an extra responsibilities for, for international peace and uh, conflict resolvement as a part of the, of the Security Council of the United Nations. And uh, Poland will uh, uh, stick and will realize all the uh, agreed United Nations resolution over the, uh, uh, the conflicts in our region. That's our position. I, I'm happy to come back to it if someone else has questions for uh, Professor Szczerski since he has to leave. I, I promise I'll answer that, though. Yeah, yeah that's fine. Hello, Alexander Papko, Polish Radio External Service. I have two questions to Mr. Shersky, and I, I'm afraid they are big, but please try to, to be uh, as short as possible, if it is possible. So, my first question concerns relations of um, uh, Three Seas Initiative and Ukraine. So, Ukrainian president was not present at the uh, Three Seas Initiative uh, meeting summit in Warsaw. This country does not participate uh, and now the relations between Poland and Ukraine are not at the highest point. So, will be Ukraine included in 3C's uh, initiatives and what are, in your opinion, the main problems uh, in relations between Poland and Ukraine and how to overcome them? So, and my second question relates to Belarus. So now, uh, Belarus Minsk is getting out from the isolation, from the political isolation, but aren't you afraid of 
in reinforcing the authoritarian regime, creating problem in the future. So how to avoid the, the term which is now coined Azerbaijanization, sorry for this world, but of Belarusian regime. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, of course, I, I, uh, I'm not in any position to comment over the internal affairs of any country and, uh, and to name and, uh, and define the nature of the, of the legitimate, legitimate uh, uh, ruling uh, institutions of any country. So uh, I, wouldn't, I, I would distinct myself from your comments over the nature of, of this or other country. Uh, if I, uh, I'm supposed to say about the three seas in Ukraine, the important thing is that was decided from the very beginning uh, uh, not to create any, any other questions over the, the initiative. That is formally only consists of the, EU, the EU member states. So this is not uh, uh, being a tool of, uh, of I would say, uh, uh, debate with the uh, rest of the European Union and the Brussels institutions over the nature of, the, of, of this initiative. If it's supposed to break, uh, if, uh, over, I mean, uh, include the countries outside the European Union, then uh, um, that will have a different nature of the uh, of the endeavor, and uh, and they would even more uh, uh, been vigil vigilantly uh, uh, seen from uh, from this other capital. So uh, we keep the uh, the three C's initiative uh, formally uh, 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 limited to the uh, to the EU member states. Because of course, also the uh, the other countries of the of the um, of the initiative would like to enlarge it to the different uh, uh, I would say directions. Because uh, we got still uh, um, uh, unfinished uh, integration of the Western Balkans, for instance. So um, there'll be much more questions over the uh, uh, outside the EU members of the of the Three Seas Initiative. But at the same time, we all know by practice that Poland is investing also in the uh, interconnectivity of uh, of the Ukraine to to the uh, uh, to, to the uh, European Union, and uh, we do uh, a lot to uh, to build up the roads and gas and other uh, interconnectors with Ukraine. So, in practice, uh, uh, we see it as a uh, as a larger uh, uh, common market, a larger common space of of um, uh, of interconnectivity. But in the same uh, in the same time, the uh, the three Cs uh, uh, is supposed to be the in, intra European EU uh, uh, group of countries. Let me, I would very much argue uh, uh, on the, on the uh, assumption that uh, Polish-Ukrainian uh, uh, relations are in a kind of uh, uh, shape that uh, that you you would uh, you, you, you define as uh, as a weak. Uh, uh, on Friday, I am going to have a long conversation here, which is my f uh, good com uh, friend and. Uh, Close cooperator, the, uh, the political or diplomatic advisor to President Poroshenko uh, uh, here in in, uh, in, uh, in Warsaw, just just as a result of uh, and just to you know, exchange the uh, the information and uh, and put some more uh, common uh, strategies after the President Poroshenko visits uh, uh, Washington and uh, President Trump visits Warsaw, and Rex Tillerson was uh, just about in. Uh, in Kiev, so we got a lot of uh, lot of things to discuss. So we got we are in frequent contacts, and uh, and you know that we keep the also the pace of the Polish uh, Ukrainian uh, uh, meetings on the highest level. The uh, the presidents uh, uh, every year that they uh, they meet at least twice. Uh, that was agreed uh, every time in, during the United Nations General Assembly, and every time one, one, once a uh, uh, official visits, so we exchange official visits every year. So we keep the pace of the highest level. We keep the pace of uh, of the uh, of the working level, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is also in a very very close co cooperation with the Ukrainian. The only thing that is missing, and that's uh, that's the uh, uh, that's the fact, is that Poland uh, is not the part of the uh, of the Minsk process, formal formally. Uh, but that was not the mistake of us. That was a mistake of uh, of. Uh, of the uh, of the past years, and since uh, and since uh, we are not uh, a part of that process, someone can uh, uh, mis misjudge the situation that uh, Poland is not uh, that much uh, uh, active on the Ukrainian side. But that's not the question of uh, of uh, decision of the current uh, leadership of Poland. It was decision of the past leadership of Poland. Professor Szczerski will be leaving very shortly, but I want to ask one very quick question which you can answer yes or no to. So given the fact that those countries that Donald Rumsfeld once called old Europe 
will most likely not be very happy with uh, the cooperation uh, being offered by the 12 countries of the three Cs. Uh, and if they decline to fund the building of the pipelines that are being planned, are the 12 countries prepared to undertake the funding on their own? Yes or no? Yes. Are you ready to pay for the pipelines that you want to build with 11 other countries uh, between Croatia and Poland? Uh, the cohesion of the, of the region of Central Europe uh, is, uh, 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 I would say, as the, uh, Matthew Brizza said, is our uh, uh, gift to the cohesion of Europe. Uh, uh, so we don't think this, uh, this should be uh, seen as a divisive initiative. And, uh, and of course, the, uh, we are investing uh, our own money into securing the, uh, uh, the diversification of, of, this, uh, of this gas market in this, uh, in this region. But uh, uh, if the word community means something really in the European Union, uh, uh, I wouldn't see this as a, as a potential scenario. Thank if you. not, then we are living in another, another world, but then we have to get in terms with another world, world we are living in. Very good. Thank you very much. Okay, more questions for Ambassador Brizza? And I should answer the Nagorno-Karabakh one too. Yeah. So I, um, the answer is a simple human weakness one. I mean, I'm, like, I'm compartmentalizing now, trying to shift my brain back to Central and Eastern Europe from my normal life in Turkey and the Caucasus. But you're absolutely right. I mean, the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict is uh, one of the tragic examples of what happened when the Soviet Union, the great, greatest event, I think, in recent history happened, uh, in sharp contrast to President Putin's take. Uh, and the statement by the Minsk Group, to me, is, as I said publicly uh, after this last the, the killing of uh, Azerbaijani civilians by Armenian shelling, uh, was terrible. I mean, it was anodyne. It could have uh, applied to any shooting in any conflict anywhere in the world at any time. And it was as if the, my, my successors, the co-chairs of the Minsk Group, decided, well, we're on vacation now. We really don't want to deal with this. And we're just going to condemn violence. Uh, and so I, I hope and I would guess there's a lot more about to happen behind the scenes in investigating what actually happened. The Azerbaijanis view is absolutely this was a provocation by Armenia. Um, Azerbaijani side responded, yes, with, with new and heavy weapons. Very interesting, the Armenian side, at least as of Friday, the Armenian Foreign Ministry and Defense Ministry had said nothing. The Armenian media referred to the so-called Ministry of Defense of Nagorno-Karabakh uh, which made a, a statement that never denied that Armenia shot first, never addressed Azerbaijan's statement about a provocation. That's quite a dramatic disparity in, in statements. And if nothing else, if I was still the mediator, I would want to get to the bottom of why Azerbaijan accused Armenia of a provocation and Armenia didn't say it was not a provocation. So th this issue, uh, as it continues to drag, uh, keep, makes it impossible for that part of extended Europe to be fully brought into the geopolitical family uh, of the rest of the transatlantic community. So I understand we have two more questions and then we're going to break. Uh, hello, my name is Aida Nair and I'm a graduate student at the University of Bologna in Italy. Uh, my question will be about uh, President Trump and Iran. Uh, because we are always talking about diversification and about energy resources and after 2015, after the nuclear deal, actually Iran, uh, actually Iran came back to the international scene uh, after the, the lifting of sanctions. So I'm, I'm curious about uh, President Trump's critics on Iran. Why uh, has Trump been so harsh on Iran? Because I think Iran has a big potential, especially on gas, and why, we, why Europe doesn't try to use it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. good question. It was, uh, you know, that, that issue is something in the Bush administration we explored as well, before the Bush policy was clear. We, when there was such a focus after the Russian natural gas cutoffs in 2006 to Ukraine and then the rest of Europe. Uh, and in the end, the other issues in play with Iran, frankly, support for terrorism, and nuclear program overtook everything else. So 
In the case of President Trump, um, first of all, let's make sure we come from the same starting point. Um, the lifting of sanctions on Iran didn't lift U.S. sanctions on Iran. The lifting of sanctions was the lifting of the so-called secondary sanctions of the United States. So the sanctions the United States would impose on other countries, banks, financial, uh, commercial entities, if they did business in Iran. So the U.S. lifted those. But the U.S. sanctions against Iran's development of uh, missile technology and terrorism, support for terrorism, remain there. Um, and by the way, I was, I was, well, I probably shouldn't, well, I, I was a target of, of a few Iranian attempts when I was ambassador to Azerbaijan. So that stuff is real. It's not just rhetoric. I mean, you know, and my whole family was targeted. So um, if you really know what's going on, uh, there are reasons to be concerned about what Iran is, it remains up to. Um, so, but President Trump, I think, he also has decided that the agreement itself is uh, an Obama agreement, to put it quite bluntly. And so he's not going to embrace something that was one of President Obama's greatest triumphs. I, I don't think that's a wise reason uh, to oppose that agreement. And I think there's no way President Trump can uh, destroy that agreement with Iran, that six-party agreement, because it's not just an agreement between the U.S. and Iran. So um, I think the agreement, no matter what President Trump decides, uh, is going to remain legally in force. The question is, would President Trump go so far as to undertake other actions that would de facto undermine the meaning of that agreement? And that remains to be seen. But I think primarily um, he, he's trying to be the anti-Obama, uh, and now we do see that some big European companies are coming in. I mean, Total just announced, right, today, I mean, the announcement's out, that it's going to now move in in a major way into South Pars, the world's biggest natural gas field, uh, and develop it. One more point. Um, until now, it hasn't been an attractive business venture to invest in, in Iran's oil and gas sector. The terms of the deals have been really difficult commercially. It's been hard for international companies to make money. Iran is talking about changing the terms of those deals. So the basic idea is that if you're an oil, international oil company, um, to raise the value of your company, raise the value of its stock price, its share price, you need constantly to be adding reserves to your balance sheet, right? Book the reserves. Say, you need to be able to say, my company owns those gas and oil reserves in the ground. And until now, Iran won't allow that. In, until now, they just, the Iranians allow there to be a service agreement whereby you can take the oil out, make money off of it, but you can't put it on your balance sheet. So that's been less attractive for the big companies. But I think they're going to work something out here shortly. Agnieszka Legutska, Polish Institute of International Affairs. Thank you very much for your extraordinary presentation in which you show saying uh, the conclusion was different. I said, well, no, no it wasn't. Uh, my job was to write up the conclusions, right? No, no, it wasn't. I mean, I have my own notes here. I leaned over to my colleague. Wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it was this. And the person on the phone said, no, 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 that's not what the conclusion is going to be. We don't want that to be the conclusion. It, but your boss in the meeting agreed. I, no, he didn't. He didn't agree. I'm saying he didn't agree. And I said, but, but that's not acceptable. And, and then she said, if you don't like it, I'm going to call your boss. And that's what happened. So the boss has to decide, I'm going to fight for this, this is what it is, and I'm going to see this decision through the system. And I'm not confident President Trump will, will be able to do that because I think his views are going to be constantly changing depending upon the latest thing he heard from President Putin. That's my worry. I'm afraid we're out of time. We have three panels that are going to begin momentarily. So uh, I thank you very much, Ambassador Brissett, for coming and taking questions. And I invite all of you who are interested in the panels that are about to begin uh, to travel upstairs a couple of floors uh, and wait for your speakers to arrive. Thank you. Thank you so much.